It wouldn't be a history of comics class if we didn't dedicate some time to talking about manga, Japanese comics. So the term manga was created actually in the 19th century. Uh, the early 1800s, there was this artist, Hokusai. Here's his self-portrait. Uh, you might recognize his work specifically through The Great Wave, which uh, just about everybody has a poster of on their wall. This is actually a series of paintings that Hokusai did while he was exploring uh, Mount Fuji and the surrounding islands as he was studying the elemental powers of nature. Japanese art, with its inclusion of captions here, translates very well into comics. In Hokusai's creations, we'd see many similar comic ideas, beginning especially with his dictionary. So, at the same time that Europeans were trying to put together dictionaries, uh, he was creating a Japanese dictionary. Since they use ideograms rather than alphabets, it was a bit difficult to try to organize everything. You know, you can't just list the words alphabetically. So instead, it's a thematic dictionary, which, being an artist, he incorporated images. So here's the entry for firearms and guns. And here we have a Portuguese merchant uh, selling a gun to a Japanese citizen. We have some words explaining in the background. And he did a whole series of these, and he called them manga. Fast forward then to the 1940s, and we have this guy, Osamu Tuzeku. Much like Topfer had been doing comic strips in the early 1800s, Hokusai was pretty much doing comics, although it was his artistic passion. It wasn't really a medium of its own at the time. So once he had passed, things quieted off. And in fact, uh, most comics in Japan for the next century were called komiksu, and they were imports, uh, typically from the UK, where they would replace the English words with Japanese and uh, very cheaply and easily reprint uh, images that someone else had created. So there wasn't too much of a demand for local comics. Following World War II, uh, Japan was totally devastated and had to rebuild all of its industries, uh, including even the entertainment industry. While they did during the American occupation, they brought in American comics, specifically Disney comics. So Osama Tezuka grew up reading these, and he was uh, too young to fight in World War II, but came of age shortly afterward and told his parents, I want to create Japanese comics. And his parents said, no, you're going to be a doctor. So he went to medical school and became a doctor. And in addition to that, created Japanese comics, uh, which he didn't want to call them komiksu, since those were specifically imported comics, and instead went back and brought in Hokusai's term manga and created Astro Boy. So other comics had been going a little bit, but Astro Boy was one that really stuck home. Uh, he was a little atomic robot who could go around and fight giant monsters. You can definitely see the Disney influence with small mouths, giant eyes, large hands. Uh, in fact, just change those hands to gloves and add some ears on top and you would pretty much have Mickey. So when anybody ever complains about why anime characters always have large eyes, well, it just goes back to Disney princesses. In addition to creating the comics themselves, Osama Tezuka also furthered the industry, he invested a lot of his doctor money into publishing houses and distribution, getting these uh, comics into bookstores, which uh, eventually grew into manga shops. And we had our first, what we're going to call an age of manga, uh, this golden age, where it's uh, all kind of kid-driven. Everything's very friendly. They had not only adventure stories, where Astro Boy is saving the world, uh, but also animal stories, such as Kimba, the White Lion, uh, which was a story about an orphaned lion in Africa who overcomes his evil uncle and... He becomes the leader of the Pride uh, and the rest of his cohorts, such as his um, chipper posh bird friend and wise baboon, which uh, sounds very similar to today's, which we might say, well, you know, there's the Lion King with Simba, uh, which according to Disney's lawyers, there is no connection whatsoever between Kimba the White Lion and Simba, although from the artist's perspective, there is quite a bit. And... Uh, after some legal questions, it was determined that nothing was specifically copied, uh, although while the artists would say, we grew up watching this, so of course somewhere in our subconscious we're going to get picked in. Just as Osama Tezuka created a print industry, he also furthered the anime industry, where we have uh, animation coming out of these stories and being very popularly sold, not only in Japan, but also internationally. So a lot of the artists working at Disney in the 90s had grown up during the 70s watching a lot of these Kimba the White Lion stories. So, of course, subconsciously, it would have worked in there. 
Just as comics readers grew up in America, uh, the comics readers in Japan also grew up. Uh, they no longer wanted you know, cute stories of fighting monsters or uh, animals, but they wanted something a little bit darker. And so we have a second era of Japanese comics running from the 1970s to the 80s that we're going to call the Gekiga era, uh, which is Japanese for darker. And they're going to get much more grown-up stories, such as Lone Wolf and Cub, uh, the story of this uh, ronin samurai, the samurai whose uh, master has uh, forsaken him and now he's on his own. Uh, he adopts an orphan child from the battlefield, uh, pulling from the Japanese myth of the peach child. And so we have this uh, strange juxtaposition of external conflict where he has to fight all the bad guys, but then also internal conflict where he has to protect this child uh, and raise it up right. So, which of course has inspired lots of people and uh, is a mainstay throughout literature in many different cultures. Uh, and you might even see it in today's Mandalorian from Disney+. Plus. Another darker creation during this time was Speed Racer. So which typically we think of Speed Racer, you know, being kind of corny and funny. Uh, but the Speed Racer that we were importing uh, was a cartoon, and so uh, they assumed was meant for kids. But if we look at the Japanese version, it's actually really dark with explorations of uh, illegal racing and uh, people fixing races for bets, uh, as well as people getting killed in racing accidents. Famously, during the Speed Racer cartoon, uh, the characters would have their mouths keep moving, uh, even though the dubbing had already finished, and people you know, would poke fun at that. But the reason that it's moving uh, is because several words were taken out, uh, specifically swear words. Here we have one of the covers of Speed Racer where machine guns are firing and he's throwing a grenade at a guy, and that guy's not going to make it. Despite having a very adorable face, uh, this is definitely a much more grown-up comic than Astro Boy. Just as we saw diversification in the Bronze Era of comic books, uh, we got diversification during the Skekika Era of manga. Female artists were coming on board and creating characters such as the Rose of Versailles, which during this story uh, is about a French princess who's being protected by a guard who turns out to be a young lady uh, dressed as a man. It comes into explorations of romance and identity uh, far ahead of what other comics would be doing internationally. Getting into the 1990s, we can talk about another era of Japanese manga, which I like to call the International Era. After relaxation of pornography laws, uh, there became a massive export of Japanese art and artistry going all over the world, uh, which not just pornography, but once those connections were built, people started exporting and importing all of these comics. So with huge international demand, uh, Japanese artists are not only cranking out material for themselves, but for everyone. And with that, we have a huge explosion of genres. Uh, here in America during the 90s, we had superheroes and not much else. Uh, but in Japan, if you could create it and find an audience for it, then it became a genre. Many of the genres would be targeted toward age groups, uh, like young boys with adventure stories or older boys with robot stories and giant mechs, uh, or uh, young girl stories with cute animals and, and older girl stories with high school romances. Uh, but in addition, we get complicated genres that anybody can enjoy, such as the Magical Princess, which got started with Sailor Moon. Going into the 2000s, we can have a story like Full Metal Alchemist, which takes place in kind of this diesel punk fascist kingdom where some people have magic powers and can manipulate matter, called alchemists. This, of course, doesn't fit into traditional genres, but once again, since there's a market for it, anybody can create anything. Another story that shows this uh, mixture of genres, we have a uh, crime mystery in Death Note, where people are mysteriously dying off, and it seems like there's a connection, so they're trying to piece together who it is on the one side. But on the other side, it's a fantasy story, where a young man is approached by a demon with his uh, Death Note, his notebook, where if you write in people's deaths, uh, you can predict their time and how it happens. And so it's all this manipulation of, well, what if you had this, what could you do with it? And so, of course, first he like gives heart attacks to uh, evil criminals who need to be bumped off, but then he can get into more details and uh, describe things happening around them and have those come true, too. So a very complicated genre. And we can even see the reflection of other genres coming into America, such as My Hero Academia. 
This takes superheroes and puts them into a Japanese perspective of studying their powers and seeing what they can do and being very reciprocal so that superhero fans in America pick up comics from Japan, feed on them, and of course have those comics again inspire superheroes within America. This is why I like to use the term international comics, because not only is Japan exporting ideas, but also importing and continuing to be a leader in comics creation. But as we'll see from international comics, they certainly aren't the only one.